Fine, and Jared, you're ready to go, and uh, it's all going great. Okay, uh, I'm going to make this microphone active, and um, a big thank you once again to James for uh, his previous presentation on GDPR. And uh, first of all, let's uh, or introduce the panel to you. We have James uh, Irvin, who is a project uh, administrator of the Clan Irwin DNA project. We have Debbie Kennett who is a project uh, administrator of, of several DNA projects and the writer of the uh, very popular blog, Cruise News. We have John Cleary, who is the project administrator, again, several DNA projects, including the Scottish Prisoners Project, which is tracing the descendants of 150 Scottish prisoners who went over to New England in 1650. We also have Donna Rutherford, who is a project administrator and also has set up the DNA Help for Genealogy Facebook group, which has thousands of members, and she writes to all of them. <laughs> and we also have Jared Corcoran, who is uh, the ISOG Ireland representative. So can you please give a warm welcome to our panel of experts. <laughs> now, uh, there's several questions that I've put together, uh, having talked to a variety of different people, um, and I'm trying to kind of address the questions that are relevant to the individual person taking a DNA test. And uh, what we're going to do is start off with, um, uh, and we're going to start off with Jared at this end, and move down along. First question is, what are the biggest issues for you today in regard to privacy and data protection? So that's the question for each of the members of the panel, and we'll start with you, Jared. What do you think are the biggest issues in terms of privacy and data protection? If you use the microphone. Yeah, I'd probably um, divide it into two. I have my day job, which is sort of multinational, and um, uh, I think multinationals are fairly well organized. Mm -hmm. uh, we had to go through uh, extensive training and examinations and so on and so forth. I think all of the big platform companies uh, had to go through this process. So I think multinationals are fairly well um, uh, uh, organized and, 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 and prepared. Um, the, uh, it, it's more difficult when you get into their organizations. They take, for example, the GAA, which is all over Ireland. They have uh, hundreds of or, uh, um, organizations. Some may not be so familiar with um, the use of IT systems. Uh, I, I think it can be a more, little bit more problematic there. As, an, as a DNA administrator, I think uh, the main thing is uh, keeping it simple, right? I, I don't think we can dive into all of the volumes which um, have been mentioned earlier, uh, but certainly get consent, right? Uh, be, if someone wants to be forgotten, have a methodology to allow them to be forgotten. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Donna? Um. Uh, well, like Jared, I also work in a big corporate and have been through a lot of training around uh, GDPR and as it relates to us in a big IT organisation. And I also belong to several community uh, organisations as well where I help them understand uh, what we need to do. And, and that actually that right to be forgotten has been something we've been quite careful about in community organisations where we've held uh, lots of paperwork on people's names and addresses in, in a local area. And we've actually gone through and destroyed a lot of that because of GDPR. We want to make sure we're not holding anything that people might think we could use at some point. And I think it's the same with um, really, really with DNA. If we're holding information that people might be uncomfortable with, I think they need to understand what information we're holding first. Um, and then if they really are worried about it, then we should remove that or they should remove themselves from a project or they should not do a DNA test if, if it's something they're really concerned about. Um, but I, I think what we can't do is tell people how they should feel about their own privacy because I think privacy is a very personal thing. What I feel about privacy is probably very different to everybody else in this room. Um, I'm quite a public person, you know, I, I'm quite open <coughs> about a lot of things, but I know other people aren't, but I don't have the right to tell them they should be more open and they don't have the right to tell me I should be more private. So I think we've got to cater for people more individually than we have in the past. Very good. John, biggest issues today for privacy and data protection from your point of view? Um, I suspect we're probably going to be large in agreement on the panel about, about this. Clearly we all agree that um, the most important thing is what the testers feel about their data and the control they have over the data. So another way of looking at it is from the point of view of 
how do we run a research project and what kind of involving people, involving living people who are submitting their data to their projects. So we are part administrators of projects. We're also people who are researching the surname or the group um, labeled by that project. And so we need to make sure we're also following strict and stringent ethical procedures in respect of how that data is being handled on behalf of, of those members. And two big principles are um, do no harm and do good. And a lot of uh, research ethics um, principles and guidelines are shaped around the details that arise out of those two principles. So I think I agree with the first two speakers. We have to defend the interests of our testers. We can't tell them what they think. We can, of course, help to uh, set their minds at rest and educate them about issues they may be uncertain about, which we may also be uncertain about. Um, clearly, as we move into uh, an era of whole genome testing, there are huge new um, issues being thrown up about what kind of DNA data um, it may or may not be uh, safe to um, post in public, which would be different to how we may have um, shaped our responses um, in, in the age of uh, Y testing and autosome and SNP testing. So we do have new challenges ahead. We need to educate ourselves, but we also need to um, work with our members to make sure that they're not basing decisions on misapprehensions about what actually is or is not. Great, thanks, John. Debbie, biggest issues for the individual DNA tester today? I think, um, Tom, the biggest issue is, uh, is we need to find a way of educating the genetic genealogy as a community as a whole because I keep seeing people who think they have a right to other people's <coughs> data, and especially in the age of Facebook and you know, Twitter. Um, I see people who've taken tests, they get carried away with their enthusiasm. They want to share, they want to ask questions, but in doing so, they end up revealing all sorts of personal information about, say, people on their match list or other family members. And we need to find some way of uh, sort of Curbing harnessing the enthusiasm, the enthusiasm but also in ensuring that they see things from other people's perspectives and not just their own perspective. And I think that also applies particularly when people are in the... Um, when people are looking in unknown parentage cases and so quite often you see some very sensitive data that's being revealed about relationships and uh, i think it depends on which facebook group people are in um, as to you know how much that, that, that those sort of things are, are moderated but i think i think we are in danger if, if if we as individuals don't respect the privacy of others then there could be regulation coming down upon us and it could endanger all of us okay uh, James, biggest issues for you today? Yeah, um, first of all, I think all <coughs> five of us, and all, I'm fifth, agree. I think there's no dissent, but different degrees of emphasis. My personal concern is my, I'm now feeling a lot more confident as a project admin that if my individual members want advice on GDPR, I'm a lot more confident in, in the boundaries. Uh, the middle is a bit of a clear, <coughs> but the boundaries to me are much more clear, and I've got more self confidence if they're in Europe. I'm much more worried about the American members of, of my project and the American customers of FTDNA, whether they're going to get advice that is compatible with my attitude or our attitude, I think, on GDPR. That is much more difficult because there are cultural differences here, legal differences, but I don't think either side of the pond feel comfortable about. Um, it's not a fundamental difference, it's a matter of degree, but, but there are approaching a pro common problem from two different directions and we're no one in the middle on that. Okay, well you're still at the microphone then. Um, who, who owns our data? This was a question that came from individuals um, related to privacy and data protection. Who actually owns the data, just for clarity? I'm going to be very radical on this. Forget it. I, uh, if we had four coffee cups here, I would grab someone and say, I've got your DNA. Because I have. If you drunk a cup of coffee, I can get that now analyzed. And not only can I get your S3Rs, I can get your full genome. Your DNA is no more private today than private today than your photograph. You walk down the street. I might be breaking the law, but you know, some people aren't worried about that. <laughs> <laughs> I could be, but if I you know, if I had I had money behind me, and, and this is radical. But but and I'm not suggesting I'm not suggesting in the slightest that that, that is the uh, the approach to be taken. But we are getting a little bit a little bit uh, 
Fleet Madonna is just like, ah, oh, DNA. Well, I mean, we all agree, it's our family's DNA. It's not our personal DNA. We share it with our immediate members of our family. Um, I'm not suggesting the problem of this gets rid of the problem, far from it. But to say this DNA is mine, as opposed to my brothers or the testing companies or the project administrators, it shades of grey to mine. Sorry. Debbie, who owns the DNA? Well, I agree we own our own DNA and we have the right to do what we want with our own DNA, but I also think that we should be very sensitive that our DNA is shared by our siblings, by our parents, by our cousins, and we also need to think of them when we are sharing our data. So it may be that there are situations where you need to get consent from them if it is something that's particularly sensitive. Um, not Nothing to do with rights, but just purely out of respect. John, any concerns about DNA ownership? Um, I'm going to slightly disagree with James here because so he's uh, talking about my DNA <coughs> or a coffee cup, but actually that's not my DNA, that's my tissue. And certainly in the UK and the North, there is the, the Human Tissue Act which prevents you from taking that and using it. Uh, yes, you can, you can probably do it scientifically, but you couldn't legally publish the data you derived from that test. I don't know what the law is in Ireland, but that was, by the way, and the potential is different, but maybe Jared might know. Um, so, um, <laughs> who owns our data is a different question. It's once the data has been derived, who has the right to publish that? Um, you do. And ultimately, if it's data that you have granted for some form of research project, you have the right to determine how it's used, you have the, the right to draw it, unless it's been anonymized um, into a study, and unless, which of course you must give consent for that to happen. So, I think there's actually a consent issue. It's you're giving consent for the data derived from experiments done on your own personal human tissue to be used in certain ways. And you have the right to put it into a project, you have the right to withdraw that. And it's not quite the same as what Debbie was talking about, which is of course the issue that bits of my DNA, including almost all of my Y DNA, uh, are replicated in other members of my family. So if I publish that and publish something that may belong to them, what does belong to them? And of course, we don't necessarily know what proportions it may belong to other people. So a pattern of DNA data that I have is unique to me. I believe I do have the right of disposal over that, but um, it, it, again, I have the right to decide to put it into projects and the right to withdraw it. So in that sense, there, 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 there is ownership. And that can grant uh, the rights of use to other people. But <coughs> Donna? Um, yeah, obviously I obviously agree. We own our own DNA. But I think one of the things that's happening with DNA uh, testing, it's probably more of a question really, is that when we're doing a DNA test, we're not only exposing our own information, we can actually be exposing a lot of information about our own family. Um, and if we're hunting down uh, bio parents for adoptees and families, and uh, we're chasing people that are matches to those people, we could be, you know, we're identifying perhaps a family secret that someone hasn't realised has come out because they've done a DNA test. Um, so by doing a DNA test, I could actually find out that maybe one of my dads has a secret uh, child because that child is tested and matches to me and is trying to find out who their biological family are. And I don't know that any of us think about that when we do a DNA test. We think about ourselves, but maybe not what we're exposing in our family. Um, so whilst we own our own DNA, do we actually own the right to expose our family? Secrets, yes. Yeah. Yes, I believe absolutely that whoever tests their DNA owns the DNA and should provide consent for it to be used and can withdraw that consent at any time for it to be used. Uh, I, that, I, in the same way, I believe we should own our own medical records, which we don't. Very often they're hidden in, in filing cabinets and trying to get access to them is a major issue. I believe everyone should own their medical uh, records and data. Uh, I welcome new business models come into the genomics because we're going from, uh, you know, testing million SNPs to testing three billion SNPs. A lot of data. Uh, so we need systems in place to manage that. I welcome the new business model like, for instance, Nebula Genomics, which is founded by George Church, where uh, uh, you can uh, uh, offer to provide your DNA. It is registered on a blockchain, so it's an immutable uh, audit trail. Uh, and uh, whatever researcher wants to use your DNA, they can subscribe to that. 
you are alerted to it, you can withdraw consent, you can permit it, they can provide you a small payment, micropayment for doing that. I think these type of, of business models will come in, uh, Shivon are doing the same. So uh, I would welcome that, but definitely the tester owns their DNA. Very good. What are the dangers of publishing your data? This is a question, yeah, but you, you have the microphone, Jared, yeah. so we'll start with you. And this is a question that a lot of people have. Um, what are the dangers of actually having my data out there? Well, I admire a few uh, people like James Watson, <laughs> published his DNA. Uh, Jay Flatley, the founder of um, Lumina. Uh, you can go up onto his website, you can download a magnificent app for free, and you can download Jay Flatley's full genome. Also, I'll have a look at it and play around with it. Uh, uh, if you order the George Church, he says to the students, several people, of course. And in the Open Genome Project, that is the principle of the Open Genome Project. So as a, a, a volunteer, citizen scientist, I would tend to share that type of thing. There are dangers, of course, right? And uh, you know, they definitely shouldn't uh, share children's DNA, or it, it should be uh, consensual, it should be adults who make that consent, and they can withdraw that consent. So. <laughs> Dangers of publishing your data, Don? Um, actually, this is something I'm really interested in because I, because I like to write a few blogs and I've written some about some of my family from a genealogy, a genealogy point of view, and I'd really like to publish some of the things I found out about my family through doing DNA testing, but I don't really know how to do it without exposing who my DNA matches were, and I feel like I can't do that. But I have actually seen... Um, it's something happened with one of my matches who wanted to publish a lot of information, include my family, didn't ask for my consent, and I found all his blogs about the analysis he's done on his DNA matches, including me and my family, and he actually got my family the wrong way around. I had my mother as my daughter and my uncle as my father, and but it was all written up in his blog pages, and, and he... Although he didn't expose our, our last names, he exposed um, our first names, and I just felt that that was wrong, at least he could have asked consent. So I, I actually haven't published anything about my, my DNA matches. I wrote up a small booklet for my family when I went home in, in August explaining a lot of stuff about Rutherfords and things I found out through DNA tests. Now, I did actually mention the name of the DNA matches, and at the end of that little booklet, I said, please don't show this to anyone, because I really felt quite concerned that I'd expose some people. And, and not, for, not, not that they'd done anything wrong, but I hadn't asked if I could write about them and, and print a booklet out and take it to the other side of the world. So yeah, it's something I'm, I'm really interested in, is how we, can, how we can share information and not expose data or not expose people. So I don't have an answer, it's just a, another question. Sure. No, that was a very good example. Yeah, I've had many questions about this as well. I mean, um, I wonder if it's um, publishing DNA as such is necessarily the problem. Um, the problem really is what others may do with that data once it's published. So the, the very general um, problem is that you would lose control of that data. If you publish it, you can no longer withdraw it from um, other studies or, or other uses. You, you lose the um, power to consent to other uses because you published it. So others then can get their hands on it and use it as they will. As they will. But I wonder actually, is that necessarily a bad thing? I really don't know. And it's one of those things that I'm, I'm wondering and thinking about a lot at the moment. Um, a few years ago, but not quite sure this example is really uh, directly connected, but uh, a few years ago, long before I was involved with the people like Morris and Debbie and gen gen genealogy, um, before I got lured onto the, onto the carousel. Uh, of, the, of these talks uh, every year in, in Dublin, um, we had cause to think about whether we should um, do some genetic testing for a particular uh, variant that may be related to a particular disease in our family. And one of my cousins was approaching me to say, would you take this test chain? And at this stage, knowing far less um, about even the little I know at the moment about, about genomics, I was reluctant to do it because my fear was that if I uh, was to test for that particular variant and found to be positive, would I then be required to report that to insurance companies and therefore potentially affect my um, insurance and insurability in the future? And that's different from publishing. In a sense, that's a different usage because um, insurance companies may be saying, therefore, if you know something about yourself, you must disclose that before we insure you uh, legally. 
Um, if we move to a situation, I don't know, a thought experiment, if everyone just puts their DNA in line like James Watson, um, would it actually affect, um, affect us in terms of our insurability? Would insurance companies be able to use that data? There's so much of it that they couldn't process it. And you can't anyway make, um, in most cases, direct predictions about the likelihood that somebody would have disease or condition X or Y just from seeing the DNA sequence alone. So maybe perhaps we're a bit fearful about the effects of publishing and perhaps we can be better advised to move to a state where we just let it go out there and not worry about it because maybe it's not going to harm us that much. I don't know. Well, in Ireland, we have a very elegant solution. Uh, the Irish insurance companies uh, overcharge us all equally. <laughs> <laughs> but do we actually publish our data, Debbie? Because um, when you look at ancestry, uh, my heritage, family tree DNA, say for autosomal DNA, they're showing you your matches. That's not your raw data, is it? No, so I wasn't quite sure about the question in the first place. I would actually. Um, because I actually think there are a lot of benefits from publishing data, uh, and that is how we advance our knowledge, that is how we advance science. So I'm a member of UK Biobank, um, they have, they've genotyped everyone at UK Biobank, they are now going to be going ahead and doing whole genome sequencing on 5 million people. So the data is all anonymised, it's um, aggregated with our national health uh, records, and they've now published hundreds and hundreds of papers. Um, so they first apparently presented at the ASHG meeting. Nobody knew it existed. And then suddenly everyone realised there's this absolute gold mine. And so now we've got other countries following suit trying to do exactly the same thing. And I think we need more and more of that, but it needs to be done responsibly. It needs to be done ethically. I think that's one of the problems too many people publish without the appropriate consents in place. James, <clears throat> dangers of publishing data, whether it's well, raw data or just matches. I'm awfully orthodox. I'm not controversial. <laughs> um, I, my previous re previous remarks were, were of course, tongue in cheek. But uh, what I was suggesting, uh, of course, is illegal. And I go on to, to uh, John's point about insurance companies. By GDPR, they are not allowed to use um, the data we're talking about. To, to tinker with your premium. It's against the law. Uh, whether they follow the law is a different matter. That's what I was alluding to. But I, I think I, I wouldn't want to add to that. There's many, on balance, generalizing, there are much more benefits to publishing than there are downsides. But that's a very sweeping statement. Okay. Well, while you still have the um, uh, microphone, what about third party concerns about third party tools? Third party tools? Could you explain to well, well, like, people in the audience like me what the third, you mean yeah. by a third party tool? Well, tools like GEDmatch, DNA GEDcom, any situation where you're downloading your raw data from the company that uh, analyzed it initially and you are uh, uploading it to a third party website like GEDmatch, like DNA GEDcom, um, and there's, there's lots of Prometheus. Uh, the medical ones. So yes, there's a lot of, yeah. lot of uh, right. different I, companies out there. This is a, a classic example of how personal it is. Personally, I am not awfully enthused by the benefits of that, and therefore I would suggest on balance not to do so. Mm -hmm. But many would rightfully say I'm very ignorant and, and biased and all the rest of it, um, and I should see the bigger picture and helping society understand the benefits of going down this route. But these things are awfully personal. Um, and they are now the precautions. I, I gather these companies have, have learned that they've got to be a bit, bit more careful than they were in the past. So by and large, in principle, it's not a bad thing. But I'm, I'm not bursting to throw my DNA data at every possible person who might think they can persuade me that it's going to be beneficial for their research. I'd like to know what the, what the benefits are first. Debbie, are you going to throw your DNA around? I'm quite happy to throw my DNA around. I think we have some absolutely wonderful third-party tools developed by people like Johnny, um, Curtis Rogers and John Olson who created JetMatch. Um, but the thing we think we have to remember is all these people are doing it um, often more for love than for the money. And they're doing it often on very limited resources. So you cannot expect them to have the same, they're not going to have their own data protection officers, they're not going to have you know, expensive lawyers who can advise them on all these issues. So you have to sort of 
bear that in mind when you use these websites, you may not get quite the same protection that you would expect from a, a big company. But I would hate to see over-regulation of you know, small citizen science websites. I think we should all embrace them and support them and, and encourage them and, and provide, if, if there's anything wrong, just provide constructive criticism behind the scenes rather than sort of call them out in, in public or whatever. Very sensible. Yeah. John? Yeah, well said. Fully agree. Um, not really much more to add on, on that. I would say these are tools. Um, so they are primarily for the benefit of DNA testers to discover more about their DNA. Uh, of course, you should be very careful if you're uploading someone else's DNA results to make sure you have the proper consents, to make sure you have informed your likely relatives that they would be about the, the risks. Um, it's certainly true that if you download your raw data, from the company site that has done the test, it then becomes uh, at least a little bit less secure, probably a lot less secure. But we must also remember that under GDPR, we have a right to portability of data. So if the data is ours, we should be um, assisted, in fact, by those companies to download them and make them accessible for other platforms and other tools that we wish to use them on in order to uh, understand better the uh, results of the, um, of the test. If we rely purely on the, the native tools within the websites of the company to test, they tend not to be as satisfactory as some of the specialist tools being developed elsewhere, which address very particular needs. So we do need portability of data. We need, as David says, we need to do it responsibly and not to expose other people's DNA results um, um, illegally or unfairly and make sure we treat them with all due respect and get all proper consents. Very good. In fact, we had a good example exactly 12 months ago of what John's talking about when FTDNA at this conference last year announced we had the triangulation tool on the FTDNA site. It was taken down, what, two weeks later? Um, because it, they suddenly realised that it was exposing other people's DNA because you could see matching segments. Now, we have other ways to do that, of course, on GEDmatch and, and MyHeritage uh, allow 23 um, allow matching between um, the, the, the 22 kids. <coughs> But I, I'm not sure if everyone realises that that is available on those sites. And certainly, FT DNA didn't want to take that um, that option and took that tool down. So, I mean, for me personally, I'm more than happy to have my DNA wherever I've got it uploaded, everywhere I, I possibly can. And I admire what people are doing with the three third-party tools to help us. But I think individuals need to understand what they're doing, and maybe that's what we need to help them understand what they're doing when they're using those third-party tools. Great. So there is a need for education. Um, I suppose I was initially concerned when I first used GEDmatch to see that I could see all the emails of not only um, my matches but everyone else's matches. Which I thought it was a little bit, uh, probably needs a little bit of tightening up on that side. Uh, I, in, in my analysis, I use IBM Watson, right, for uh, SNP analysis, drawing maps, data analytics, and things like that. Does that mean I understand the algorithms which go into IBM Watson artificial intelligence? Not at all, right? But I have to trust that this organization, you know, IBM in this case, I have to trust that they've put in uh, uh, enough um, uh, checks and balances uh, to, to protect the data. I like to experiment with Google Genomics and Amazon Genomics and so on and so forth. And I think generally the, the large platforms have made large efforts to protect the data. If they didn't, they wouldn't be in business. <coughs> there have been some notable cases, the uh, Facebook uh, Cambridge Analytics uh, fiasco, right? And I think mm -hmm. Facebook suffered from that. But I think, uh, uh, you know, the tools and the, the platform companies are learning. And, uh, you know, as long as there are no major um, leaks of, 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 of data, I, was, I, uh, I would continue this mm -hmm. Well, while you have that um, microphone, it brings up nicely uh, to the next question is, who should we fear most? DNA websites, Facebook, or your bank? <laughs> Definitely your bank. <laughs> Just to try and put things in perspective. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I think historically we, we've had our banks around for a few hundred years, right? And, and we had a certain inbuilt trust because of financial protection and so on and so forth. 
Facebook, I think, has let people down, mm -hmm. and uh, they need to work hard to regain the trust of people. And um, uh, the third one was the DNA website. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I would hope they are secure. I've, I've seen some good examples. I've seen some very, very bad examples. That's really tough question. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, banks have been around forever. Facebook's been around 10, 12, maybe 15 years now. DNA websites are new. Uh, you know, I, I think there is a, a, a chance that we might see some sort of DNA controversy over the next four or five years, or maybe, uh, maybe earlier, next couple of years, that might hold back DNA testing for a while. I don't know what that controversy might be. Somebody... Uh, goes to the news about something they've found out or who, who they might be related to, somebody in power or whatever. So I think there, there is a, a possibility we might see a big controversy around uh, DNA websites in the, in the next few years, and that, that might cause a bit of a backward step for a while. But, you know, Facebook, a lot of uh, my friends left Facebook after the Cambridge Analytics uh, scandal. Uh, they're, all, they're all back on Facebook now. <laughs> Uh, I think picking on, on, on that last point, I think a lot of it is about public attitude, public perception to what we are or, or are not allowed to be in public, um, or to, to be allowed in public or connected to our names. And um, why, do, why do more people not drop Facebook after the Cambridge Analytica scandal? Um, because it's, it does what it does um, well enough to attract um, a, a critical mass of people to want to use it, and there is uh, no real alternative for the people who use it, at least at the moment. Maybe one can be created, but the thing is Facebook is there. And so the, conven the convenient thing is to say, oh, well, they that and then they put it right. I hope, fingers crossed. But I carry on using the do the things I do with it. And I think, I suspect we probably do the same with the DNA websites that we use. Um, there may well be a huge um, DNA company data breach at some stage. And uh, who knows what kind of public, public reaction there will be um, to that. So it all depends on what the nature of the data is that may be breached. But um, data breaches are happening all the way across um, all kinds of, of sectors. And I wouldn't think that the DNA companies themselves are necessarily going to be immune from that. Um, doesn't quite answer Morris's questions. I don't, I don't really know. But he didn't say, didn't say the government, Morris. <laughs> well, that's, that's true if you live in China or if you live in Kuwait, where in China, they have uh, tested 50 million people uh, surreptitiously. Um, uh, they, they put forward a, this is according to one of the newspaper reports I read, it was a health for all type of initiative, and they swapped people and didn't tell them that they actually were collecting their, their DNA. And now apparently they're using that to discriminate against the Uyghur uh, community in northern China, uh, which is Muslim, and a lot of them are being sent apparently to re-education camps which sounds very much like Nazi concentration camps. So it just brings back some of the horrors, perhaps, of uh, what we experienced in Europe 80 years ago. Um, of course, it would never happen here that we would uh, elect a totalitarian regime. You never know. <laughs> you can never see that. So, and, and I think it's also fair to say that Facebook have evolved since the scandal of Cambridge Analytica. Uh, have they evolved enough? I don't know. <coughs> anyway, Debbie, uh, what do you think about that question? Well, I think all the all the big websites are equally prone to being hacked <coughs> or to having data breaches. I don't think it makes any difference whether it's a bank or Facebook or a DNA website. But my Heritage had 92 million mm -hmm. emails yeah. potentially yeah. stolen or hacked yeah. earlier this year, January. Right, so. Yes. And I think if, if there is a risk of a data breach, it's more likely to be one of the third party websites. So, something like Genmatch is probably much more prone to um, that sort of activity. But I think there's actually more, it, it's not so much Facebook per se, it's the users and the, the information that they reveal. So, I think you're more at risk than other users revealing information about you that you don't want to be revealed. And people just seem to have a very careless attitude of, often to other people's privacy. Um, so I think there's more danger in, in that sort of thing happening, or people you know, revealing your address or your telephone number, um, rather than actually the companies revealing anything for you. Because I think we've all, I think GDPR has encouraged all of them to look again at, the, all the, at what they're doing, and I think that's actually been a, a big benefit 
and Facebook especially has really had to uh, make sure that everything is done with consent, whereas in the past they used to set everything really open and then you had to gradually shut everything down and they just assumed consent to share everything. And now you, you, for most things you have to almost, you have to actively opt in. And I think it's also important to make the point that privacy and data protection are not static concepts. They're constantly evolving. And our um, approach to uh, safeguarding privacy and data protection, that's evolving too as time goes on. James? I'm not qualified to answer because I don't use Facebook and I don't bank online. And that's not because I'm frightened of them. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, what what's, what's the others have said I agree with. But I think the government would be a, a good last question, a last option. Um, for example, the UK government, when they, when they Swansea, the driving license centre, set up a data bank, had no shame at all in selling that to private companies for advertising purposes, without mentioning it, that it was breaching our, whatever rights we're supposed to have as individuals. Uh, that was totally iniquitous. And, and GDPR has got a lot of small print that gives wriggle room to governments to do all sorts of things. They, they're a bit tight on the police side, they mutter about the medical side, but when what comes to what governments can do with, with personal data, uh, there's loopholes for law. So I think that's probably the missing ghost there. Could I suggest before we go on to those last two questions, Morris, that we go to the floor for questions. Sure. If we run out of time, we come back to those last two. Yeah. Any, any, well, we have a few questions from the uh, floor, so I'm going to come round and first of all, we'll go to, to Johnny Morris. Thanks, Morris. Um, I have difficulty or doubts about whether we could say we own our DNA. We own mixtures of DNA which we've inherited from various other people and with which we share various proportions. So if my brother, for example, with whom I share a huge amount of DNA, needless to say, he then turns around and says he wants his uh, DNA taken offline or not made, made available public, publicly. Does that mean I then have to redact those chunks of my genome with, which I share with him? So in question, it's mutually owned DNA. The precise mixture each and every one of us has is our own, but not the actual chunks. That's a great point. Any, any response to that from the panel? I, th I think it's probably self-evident, actually. Uh, John, question from John Brown. Um, I'm a guest in the uh, country of Ireland, the Republic of Ireland today, the European Union. Um, so I'm coming from an American viewpoint, child of Amer Irish immigrants, and because of that, I'm an American and Irish citizen. Um, the Americans have a completely different take, as you guys kind of indicated, when it comes to GDPR. Our viewpoint of regulation of non-elected bodies out of Brussels making regulations is... Uh, part of our DNA in the United States. <laughs> um, and the Americans um, may come from the viewpoint that you don't understand when publishing certain things, both on Facebook groups and blogs and different things, and you're like, oh my God, this is unbelievable. It's just a viewpoint that's completely different. And I think I'm just raising that voice of difference because with all regulations, whether you like them or not, or your viewpoint or your philosophy comes from a different viewpoint, there's a pendulum swing here. And I wonder if the viewpoints of the panel members have changed since GDPR came into re versus where they maybe stood three or four years ago before all this. And I'll give you a perfect example of the pendulum swinging. You brought up the idea that uh, UK uh, law enforcement agencies have had to purge people of prior convictions, for example, which is absolutely insane from an American but viewpoint. That's not actually true. The people who have convictions, mm. uh, they, they stay on the database okay. forever. Right. It's yeah. people who haven't been charged who have their data. Yeah, and, it's, and, and the point I'm trying to make here is we, the yes. pendulum can go crazy here because the recidivism mm. rate mm. on criminal activity in the United States is 68% within three years. And, and in a lot of Western countries, it's over 50%. So if you want to find out who, who, who robbed the bank, the most likely person is the person who's robbed the bank previously. Um, 
One viewpoint I want to make on Facebook, I've seen on a lot of the Irish um, genealogy Facebook groups, wide disparity between uh, their viewpoints on GDPR. And I'm, I'm interested in your, your viewpoint on this because some of these groups are obviously, most of them are closed groups that you have to have mm -hmm. membership on. But you have some where matching is not a problem and talking about DNA is not a problem. I find that sometimes if you, you're on a particular group that's less DNA friendly or free DNA, don't bring up anybody that's alive today. We don't want to know about them. It's 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 all over the place, and I think it's again a symptom of this pendulum swinging way too far over before it goes back to the middle, and it's affecting behavior today when it comes to uh, learning and, and data, data that we all want to, we all want to learn from things and we understand and respect that there had to be but I think the regulation of this industry has to come from where it came in all previous industries it has to come from within organizations like ISOG have to set up guidelines for what is it what is a genetic genealogist they have to set up guidelines of what is our own viewpoint, in my opinion, of data security with, and, and sharing of, of, of kit information and stuff. And where, where do we stand as volunteer army of genetic genealogists out there when it comes to volunteering as project admins and having blogs and coming up with all kinds of wonderful Johnny Pearl formulas and Robert Casey uses this L21 a SNP predictor tool on his blog that all of us tend to love on the Y side. All of these things take data from our sites, whether it's in a CSC form or whether it's in whatever it's pseudonized form on GEDmatch, and we're using it. And I think guidance needs to come from within because the history has a way of uh, regulating people that don't regulate themselves. <laughs> Cheers. Comments from that? Can I respond on that? I, I, I completely empathize with, with several points that you made. The pendulum thing, I think, is very significant, and the difference in how the pendulum is swinging at a particular point in time in different places in the world. I think in Europe, generally, the pendulum is swinging back towards the middle quite a bit in the last six months. We, we were very apprehensive. I wouldn't become involved in this if I hadn't been really scared almost, and I'm now quite relaxed. Um, whereas I think in further afield, across the pond, um, those concerns, that pendulum is still pretty far out. There's some pretty radical views, and you, you voice some of them as to, as to, from a common sense point of view, where the hell was, was Europe going? It would seem to be ridiculous. And if you get two good lawyers and you pay them, they will develop these arguments to the nth degree. It's nothing to do with nationality. This is a lawyer's paradise, this business, and, and they will earn a fortune uh, either attacking or defending whatever the issue is and they've got plenty of ground to work with and, and unfortunately they're the ones that are going to win out and, and, and not in the long run but in the, in the short term. Um, your point about ISOG I, I endorse completely. I think it may be more difficult to revise our guidelines than to conceive them because we want to work with some degree of unanimity and consensus and if we're going to have American underwriting of, of the next generation of our guidance, it's going to be a bit more difficult. So I'm not rushing fences on that. I'm hoping the American pendulum uh, or the pendulum of American administrators is going to swing back a bit more towards the middle. And when we come to revising it, there'll be a bit more, a bit less of this, uh, I wouldn't say unjustified concern, because in America, I think it is very justified for the recognition that, at least in Europe, this legislation is not intended to be draconian. Uh, for our activities at all, I'm sure of that. Well, in fact, uh, the, uh, we had a, a regulator here in the audience who unfortunately couldn't stay for um, this panel discussion, but I told him that it would be available on um, YouTube. It was the chap, in fact, who um, corrected you on the Irish situation. Oh, yeah. And he has been responsible uh, for uh, ensuring that GDPR is rolled out into in a, at a state level, in a state regulatory body. He was always worked for a state body, mm -hmm. but he said the whole point of the GDPR is to catch the big fry and not the small fry, and we are small fry. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. absolutely. So, I mean, I think that's very reassuring for everybody that, you know, whatever GDPR sounds, however scary it sounds, it actually is not aimed at us. It's aimed at Facebook. 
It's aimed at Google. It's aimed at these big multinationals who have access to huge swathes of data, which may be used perhaps to change the, the, the direction of a, of a presidential election, for example. That would never happen. But that would never happen. Morris, <laughs> Morris, you're, you're quite right. That was the intent. But unfortunately, the American lawyer will say it says the individual is liable for nearly as much as the corporation. And those words were put in very deliberately, it would seem. And there is prima facie cause of concern. I think in practice, that's not going to happen. Sure. But the wording is, it's, it's bad law in, from a legal point of view. It's right. so ambiguous and it's so all sweeping that the concerns are justifiable in an academic theoretical context. I think we're justified in being fairly relaxed about it, but that doesn't mean the threat isn't there. Okay, in the last few minutes, I'm going to uh, take more questions from the audience, but I just want to throw up a few slides about how to optimize your privacy and data protection. And to reiterate what the panel have said, it's very important that you choose the level of privacy and protection that you are personally comfortable with. So that's just to emphasize what the panel have said, that it is a very personal thing. But for example, you can use a false, well, first of all, you don't have to do a DNA test at all. So uh, the one great way of maintaining your privacy is not to do a DNA test. Uh, you can also delete your kit. But you can also use a false profile, maybe not Clinton's, but maybe John Smith would be appropriate. Um, you can use an alias or a pseudonym. Uh, for example, you can use letters and numbers instead of a name. <coughs> uh, never use your real date of birth. Try and look 20 years younger. I, uh, I always take 20 years off my date of birth. Uh, create a bespoke email address, especially if you're posting on Gemmatch. Where, where your email, as Jared said, is going to be open to public view, you can create a bespoke email address like 1234567 at gmail.com, which will completely just who you are and where you're coming from. Only give the minimum amount of information. So, for example, I don't think there's any need at all to put your postal address or telephone number on the Family Tree DNA order forms because it's not something that is ever really going to be used. As long as you have your email address there, um, I think that's going to be fine. Any comments on those or any additions to those? Um, I think the family tree DNA course needs the public address for your kit um, to be sent to you if you have any kit sent to you. But in any case, one of the changes since GDPR is that administrators can no longer see the public address. So I think family tree DNA has a data that are protecting it from people who don't need to have it. We can if they set their advance. Yeah. Yeah. So so the so the safeguards of family tree DNA have evolved, James. There's two details I think we, we ought to bear in mind. One, we do want the surname, the true surname, yes. because in my DNA, that's absolutely critical. It's and important for genealogy. Sorry? It's important for genealogy. Yeah, yeah. And secondly, we want the country of residence, A, so we can trace the diaspora, and, and B, so we know which legal regime they're, working, they're coming under. Um, and I think the surname and the uh, country of residence, which are two important parts of the first address, shouldn't be excluded when we say, for example, personal address other than for the obvious purposes. Sure. And um, we have a, a comment or question down here, so I'm just going to come down. Can I uh, go against the false profile? We're trying to make contact with other members of our family through DNA. I don't like making contact with a false profile. I'm, I'm giving my information, I'm going out there to share. I didn't want to contact Tim Kishwood. I want to contact another Tullock. No. I want to contact another Rutherford. I want to contact another whatever. That's why the problem comes up, because then you know who you're talking to. Can I suggest maybe I can see where Morris is coming from with this. And I fully understand why people who are uploading, uh, I think in the um, company sites, yeah, I, I wouldn't go for quite this extent of, of concealing of data. I think the third party sites, GEDmatch for example, I understand why many people would rather conceal their identity, but I would suggest if you do create a bespoke email address, use it. So make sure it's one you're going to check to um, find the messages coming in uh, about this. And many people do uh, create special email addresses to handle the, the volume of um, of email correspondence which they can receive. So I, I do understand the, the, your point here. We do need to be able to contact people we're matching. There's no point going into these tools if we don't. Yes, we should have really options for optimizing rather than these are the uh, recommendations. It's just, really just to show what you can possibly do to uh, protect yourself. 
and I'm not suggesting that everybody should do this, and apologies if that came across, but I see now I should be saying options for optimizing, and it's not something that you should do in all cases, but if somebody is particularly paranoid about their privacy and their data protection, then these, there are safeguards out there that you can use, should you so desire, to actually optimize your privacy and uh, your data protection. Does that answer, uh, hopefully that answers some of the questions. So, I think most people can be discovered in, so yes. why, why, why go for it? So most people with a, a really good Google search and a little bit of hard work, you can trace most people anyway. Except we have telephone directory. <laughs> we have everything else. Yeah. There is so much of this trail behind down. everybody that actually fine. I mean, I've had one of these where I've find they didn't respond and I've gone through various other routes I find they are fine. Still not responding, but I now know. <laughs> Sure. Mm -hmm. It's a good point. It's very easy to actually find people online just by doing Google. John Brassel. Uh, I'd like to just make one one particular point. All right, and this was uh, really there was a reference to public, publishing data. Yeah, sorry, publishing data and what people do with it. And it, the example of James Watson and his uh, genome. That was published, but he redacted part of it because he didn't want his risk for neurodegenerative disease to be known. But there were techniques used that were able to interpolate the redacted part of that particular sequence. So he clearly did have concerns, but what people did, third party people did, was obviously to be able to work it out from the sequences either side. So that's just a point I'd make on that. The other point is really uh, is a question I would ask of you as project administrators. I know that it's a relatively short time that GDPR has been in place and the like, but have you found that that has actually adversely affected the work of your your projects, your targeting of would be testees, and you know, sort of yes. bringing forward your 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 projects. I would say that well, the biggest drawback I found is not having access to the person's country of residence and <coughs> being able to access the most distant known ancestor information because quite often I used to be able to help people to do that and now I can't do that without having to ask their permission and having extra access which I don't really need um, just to do that one simple thing. So I would hope that eventually we will get some changes so that we can get that information um, made accessible and we can actually have access to the, the most distant known ancestor field so that we can optimize it for our projects and let you know if people want us to help them then we should be able to help them without having to put them through extra hoops to do so. James, do you have comments for that? Yeah, I, I've lost six months work of, of my project in being diverted onto GDPR. Um, it's about that. It might, it might even be more. And secondly, progress in the future than it was otherwise. Debbie's alluded to some of the aspects. I think there, there may be ways around, but the whole process has got more laborious, labor intensive. The reward of being an administrator, unless you're lucky and you've got that motivation that it started in the first place, is much greater. The incentive to become an administrator has, has diminished considerably. I hope we can ride this storm and, and what we do continue, but I think it's taken a, a dent that's going to take a long time to, to pull out of. But with our enthusiasm, we can overcome that. I don't want to be pessimistic, but it, we've got a bigger hill to climb than we had before. Um, just uh, let's turn myself on. Have we lost project administrators as a result of yes. this? No, yes. No, yes. No. Yes. yes, we have lost one. World, 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 world families. Well, families have gone completely, and, and right. a lot of people depended on that to a considerable extent. I, it's a, you know, I'm asking it rhetorically. Yeah. Yeah. We know it's happened. The question is, is you know, the, the, this damage every time you lose talent. And you lose resources. I think some of the things like why search and mighty search. I think GDPR, GDPR was used as an excuse to kill them off. I don't. I mean, I think Probably. with all of these things, something could have been done um, to comply with GDPR. It's just they chose not <coughs> to uh, invest the money. And I, you can understand it for why search and mighty search. Uh, two two last slides, and then I'm going to throw it up to general discussion. Right. If you want to privatize your kit, you can do so. And you can deprivatize it to work on it then reprivatize it again afterwards. I'm just putting that there as an option, not as a recommendation. And the option is it allows you a greater level of security 
and it doesn't mean that you are uh, uh, unprivatized all the time. Okay. So if you're very paranoid about it, that's something you could do. And where from? Do you from from company side? Or from um, you can privatize it on Jetmatch. Yeah. Um, you can also privatize it on the company websites as well. Oh, so you can delete, delete it from Ancestry when you've done your... Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can also delete it from any website and you can delete it completely. If you wanted to work on other websites, you could transfer it and then work on it and then delete it. I mean, this is for the pre people that are very, very paranoid and just want a very high level of protection. There are options out there that will help you achieve that level. And then the last slide here is privatize your family tree. Very, very important for all of us is that especially if you're dealing with living people, sure, most of the time the, the, the companies will privatize the living people. Sometimes there are glitches and they don't. Uh, something I discovered, if you put anything in the death field on Ancestry, that will unprivatize a living person. So just be very careful of that. Um, so those are just some general options that you can use. But now I want to throw uh, it open to the floor again. Any uh, questions or other comments that you want to raise with the panel? We have uh, a lady down here. I'll, I'll hold this for you. Hi. Um, I just want to go back to the point about, you know, who um, who to be more scared of, Facebook, or, and I know you guys said the government would be a fourth option. Um, I think we're underestimating the, the potential there. I, I know Spotify at the moment are uh, trying a new feature where you can link from your Spotify account into your 23andMe profile, and they will uh, suggest songs to you based on your composition, right? So if you're <laughs> over 50% Spanish, they'll you know, suggest Spanish music to you, for example. But now we're going to be in a situation where people will be lured by that little feature, and then now they'll be giving their data into Spotify, right? And so we've seen what Facebook has, has done with people's data, what's to prevent Spotify from doing that. For example, with Facebook, I fought for years for them not to know my phone number. I never installed Messenger, never gave them my phone number when they asked for it. But yet somebody else gave their uh, phone book to Facebook, which had my full name in it. And so Facebook kept suggesting, is this your phone number? And they had it right. So I'm worried that we're going to go down that route with DNA, especially if Spotify now is going to get its hands on everybody's 23andMe profile. Um, I wonder what you guys thought about that. Great question. Or had you thought about that? <laughs> But um, if you're worried about things today, you ain't seen nothing yet because uh, uh, technology is growing exponentially. They say in 10 years time, we will have computers which have more processing capacity than the human brain. In 20 years time, more processing capacity than the entire humankind. So we are going to a, uh, what we call the technology singularity, and that is the ex existential trend humanity not the small issues of privacy we have today it, it's a huge issue but what you mentioned there if social networks can uh, you know combine features like between Facebook and Spotify it's very easy to do and um, uh, it's a threat to privacy less but I believe in, 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 in the longer term we've much bigger challenges to face Yeah, I agree. And you would find that's happening with advertising. You go and look for something on Amazon next minute on your Facebook and, and all the same things come up that you've just seen on Amazon. That is because everything is linked up online and you're, you're followed and tracked. In the same way, in London, I have an Oyster card, so I'm tracked around London every time I go out with my Oyster card, my credit card, my mobile phone is on all the time. Somebody at O2 knows I'm in Dublin. Um, it, you know, this this is what's happening. But it, it, I know it causes concern for people. It, it doesn't necessarily worry me so much, but I know it is a concern for people. I fully agree. I think I think it's, it's, it's linkage across databases. Um, I think is the issue here, and uh, it's happening. And I don't know what kind of regulation is of it. Perhaps what we need is a super GDPR that will tackle the issue <laughs> of oh, which yeah. databases <laughs> may and may not cross-link our data. And that's the only way we can prevent this happening, otherwise it will. Maybe one non-elected body can form another one. Well, this is all being done by sophisticated algorithms, and I think 
um, the answer will eventually be better algorithms that actually have privacy built in. And you've got things like blockchain that can encrypt data. So I think eventually it should be possible to to control these things better with technology, whereas at the moment we're still in the early stages of using these algorithms. And there was, in fact, a, um, the, the House of Parliament in the UK, they've, they've recently set up an inquiry to look into algorithms because there's very little transparency about how these, you know, how these algorithms work and what, um, what um, information is behind the decision-making process. But I would have thought, you know, things like revealing tele telephone numbers, that shouldn't be done. And I would have thought it would be easy to program in an algorithm that would stop that from happening. It's just that they're not doing that at the moment. Okay. I, can I ask sure. quickly, um, sure. the Spotify thing, I think the, the, the big word here is informed consent. And, and right. you know, what is informed Nobody consent to a teenage girl? If any of you have got um, granddaughters in the teens, the problems that are around the corner are horrifying. Okay, any other questions or comments? Patty, come over here, Patty, so you can uh, avoid the... I'll hold it for you and then you just speak. I have always got far more emails than I can handle and been very concerned about keeping my email address off web pages. The Family Tree DNA, as part of GDPR, has put every project administrator's email address on its public web pages where it can be seen by people who are not Family Tree DNA customers. Can James or anyone tell us which section of GDPR has forced FTDNA to do this? And are they in breach of GDPR by actually advertising your email address without your consent? I, I, this is part of the privacy statement. You, you, if you feel obliged to do a privacy statement, which to me is the, the the, the, the first step you take, um, you've got to declare who you are and how you can be contacted. That's that's asked for, I think. That's the way I interpret it. You can, a lawyer could find another excuse not to, but but it's, it's you can't get. It's a, all this is a compromise. On the one hand, we want to share data. On the other hand, we want privacy, and the two are irreconcilable. They clash, and and we've got to live with that. There are all sorts of wrinkles and so forth, but the, the ideal is never going to be that. Well, we have to call it a day at that point in time. I think it's been a fascinating discussion. I think you've raised some very, very interesting points. So thanks to members of the audience for participating. Um, and I'd just like to say uh, thank you to, to you all for your patience and thank you to our expert panel for their um, expertise and experience.